if what you're doing doesn't scare you or doesn't excite you, then you've got to find something that does. G'day guys, welcome back to another episode of Level Up in the Shed. So uh, it's a big one today. We're actually going back to back. We're doing two recordings in the one day and I'm absolutely pumped to have this next uh, young guest on. So this guy's going to blow your mind because uh, when I got introduced to him, he definitely blew my mind. He's achieved a hell of a lot in his short uh, career and he's, uh, he's doing something in an, inst uh, an industry which um, I just think is incredible. And he's, I think he's going to have a huge future ahead of him and I'm going to start this off by introducing you to uh, Sam from Build Clean. How are you, mate? Very well, mate. Thank you very much for having me in the shed. I'm loving the backdrop. I'm loving the bikes, loving the cars. So I think yeah, we're really going to hit it off today. Cheers, mate. So I want to get this thing started by um, letting you know how I used to talk about cleaning in my building contracts. Please, so, hit me um, hard. Yeah, hit me so hard. Cleaning is uh, something that uh, in my early days, I don't know, I just it came from feedback we would get like people never thought that we were cleaning that doing a final builders clean mm -hmm. as good as what we should have and we started putting in our building contracts that it's um, the final builders clean is not a clean that your mother would do <laughs> nice and that's a great way to word it and i think um because i've been in construction cleaning for um, on and off for about 10 to 12 years with our family had a cleaning company um, and now gone out on my own in build clean. Um, but I think what we've seen as well is that it used to be a builder's clean was a laborer's clean and now a builder's clean is a handover clean. Well, so mate, there's I've been seen... a big paradigm shift in that just in the service itself alone. So I've been doing a lot of homework on you, mate, because uh, you've won a hit. Well, you've had so many accolades, like in your business. Like how, how long's the business been going? Uh, we're almost at five years. Yeah. So yep. just to give you a little bit of background, uh, Sam's from Adelaide. All well, your businesses in Adelaide. Yep. Um, yep. And we've also um, just launched up here in Brizzy. So yeah, yeah we're good to go. And mate, and you're killing it. Like you've won entrepreneurial awards, business awards. I, I've I read that forty over forty percent of master builders in Adelaide yep. are using you for their cleans. That's exactly right. Yeah, and I think um, no one no one's kind of put their hand up in in handover cleaning and gone. We're going to do this and we're going to do it properly. Cleaning is always one of those things where you get a commercial cleaner who cleans schools and offices and everything, and they go, oh well you know, we can do that. So we'll do builders cleaning as well. And it just, there's been a, a gap there in, um, I suppose, in the marketplace and, and what the builders and the clients expect. So, yeah. And yeah. Look, 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 I back, look back to when we had a few issues with clients, uh, like back in the day, like, and to be honest, look, I didn't know any different. Like I, I did my time, I worked for other builders and I, I saw the cleans that they were getting on their job. So I, I just thought, oh, yeah, builders cleans just to mop the floors, give everything a bit of a quick wipe down and, yep. and she'll be right. But mm. When you think about it, like you've just finished building someone or renovating someone's brand new home. Yep, and like, it's their dream. It's yeah. their, doesn't matter if it's a if it's small bathroom renovation, if it's adding a second story, if it's a full rebuild. It's no doubt the best thing that they can afford, or it's the best thing that they can do at this point in time. So it's always like it's always their dream, and the process and the time that it takes to let it down at the very end is just it's a bit disappointing. Yeah, and it, as a builder, like it. That is your last opportunity to impress your client, and mm -hmm. like you don't. The last thing you want to be doing is walking through at your handover, uh, doing some defects, and then walking around like wiping dust off things. And, exactly. And or you sweating things. the night before handover because you go, "Oh my god, is this going to be okay? Are they going to pick up on this? Are they going to find this?" You know. So. Yeah, and look. Mm. To be honest, we've actually got um, like it, we the cleaners we use like they they do a good job, um, but we've got to a point where like it, we are finding it's not as far as it should be and so like we're finding on the on that last day the handover day like i've got members of my team there like we've actually got two full buckets out in the other shed there with all their cleaning gear in and like we're back there wiping things down just picking up on the few bits and pieces that probably could have been done a little bit better and yep um i just think it's fantastic mate that you've you've not only um changed the whole way that builders cleans are done um but you're just doing it in such a professional way like you're actually taking a lot of the stress off the builder we're trying to we really are trying to and thank you for saying that it's um it's reassuring to i suppose it's reassuring to have a conversation with a builder and someone such as yourself as well um and it's also reassuring to hear that what we're actually doing is making a difference um and in the industry and for the clients as well because you know, no one, no one gets thanked for what they do. You don't get the chippies, the first fix and the second fix getting thanked for what they do. It's really only 
um, from what I can see, it's really only on that day of handover when you hand over the keys to the client, is there that communication between how good the job was done. And I feel like there are some builders that will celebrate that with the team and Christmas shows are great for that. But throughout the year, you don't really get any recognition for the work you do. You only get told about the bad things. So <laughs> now well, we, we say in our yeah. office, no news is good news yeah. um, because it's kind of the unthanked job. Yeah. So just let's go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, cause we will get to all the awards and everything you've won. Cause I'm really keen to um, let the people listening know about all that, but look, you're only a young dude. Like take us back to how you've, cause I, you've told me your story. Like let's talk about how you got to where you are now. Cool. Um, I won't go back too far. Uh, but how I got into this was um, I did a Bachelor of Business. Um, while I was working there, I worked with my family's cleaning company. Um, I took a very, like a big liking to window cleaning. I felt it was the more masculine thing to do as opposed to walking around with a feather duster and a mop. So I naturally <laughs> took a liking to that. And a lot of the ego drove me um, to be the best window cleaner that I could be so that I didn't have to do the other work. Um, after finishing my degree, uh, which a pretty average student at best, um, but after finishing that, I went out and got a job to work in a caravan dealership, um, trying to get an entry level marketing job. Um, lasted about probably six to nine months there and thought, you know what, I really enjoyed the sales aspect, not so much the marketing aspect. It was kind of too data driven for me. Um, so I went and got a job at Volkswagen, learned how to sell cars, um, found myself getting very bored because when there's nothing and nobody to sell to, <laughs> there's nothing to do. So I'd so flatten my phone windows. within a couple of hours. <laughs> so there was a mower shop across the road and I was thinking, oh, you know what? I could probably go out on my own. I could probably make this work. So I thought, all right, well, I'm going to do a little bit of research, get an ABN. Um, I'm going to go and get a mower and a whipper snipper, put them in the shed. I'll use them whenever I need them. Um, and I'm also going to try and do window cleaning. So I had no idea what property maintenance was. But I went out and started a company called Ground Control. And yep. my idea was I was going to look after real estate agents while they had properties on the market. I was thinking I was going to be the ground control guy, you know, make the house perfect <laughs> so that they could keep it on the market and keep it looking its best. Um, I don't think I did a single job for a real estate agent. And um, because of my history of working with a family's cleaning company, a lot of our builders from then and a lot of relationships we had found out that I was window cleaning again. And then the vast majority of our work was in construction. Yep. So... About 12 months into that as sole trading, um, we weren't really getting taken seriously for our construction work as our window cleaning. Um, and we weren't doing anything of what we thought we would in the ground control area. We were always at Bunnings buying tools and doing jobs we didn't really understand. So um, <laughs> I kind of had to take a moment and go, what are we doing? What do we like doing? I consulted the team as well and asked the guys and we all like had a unanimous decision that we love doing window cleaning and cleaning because we come home clean and we can go to the gym afterwards. Um, and we hated doing the lawn mowing element because you get itchy, you're covered in shit and you've got yeah. to drive the trailer around. Yeah. So we rebranded, called the company Build Clean and within probably you know, four weeks, we won our first major job, a commercial job. Um, and back to back, we lined up a couple commercial jobs and we grew from four staff to 16 within you know 12 weeks or so. And it was just off from there. So Yeah, right. Mm. And so... You're the main man behind the business. Like you're the one that's... Uh, founding, but I've also got a co-director with me, Jack. Um, and we've found that because of our, I suppose, our strengths and weaknesses, we work so well together. Um, and he actually started with me. I was paying him cash when he started and he was with Ground Control. Um, and as we worked our way up, he went off interstate um, and international, went over to Canada and did his bit and had some fun. And there were moments before he'd left where I'd say, I'll give you 10 grand if you don't go. And he still went away on his holidays and he'd come back. Um, and actually a couple of years into Build Clean, um, he bought half the company with me. So I sold him on the dream. Um, and the way we work so well together is because I am the dreamer or kind of the visionary element and Jack actually gets shit done. So I'm the kind of person I can, <laughs> yeah. I can think about something and create something and get it to kind of prototype, get it to 50% of the way there. And then Jack goes, right, this is going to work. This isn't. And I'm going to finish it for you. Yeah. So yeah, we've got a really good dynamic going on there. Yeah, that's unreal, mate. So what? And then, so fast forward to now. So, yep. what you've been going five years? Going almost five years. Um, got about sixty staff on the team with us, and we're now opened in um, in Queensland. So we're an SA in Queensland. Yep. And do you have plans to take it right around Australia? Or? Absolutely. Yep. 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 We've got a little motto in the office: five by twenty-five. So we're gonna have five major cities by twenty twenty-five. That's awesome. Um, and it's one hell of a mission. It scares the shit out of me. So that's yeah. where we want to be. Mate, I think it's fantastic. So, but just I just want to go back because when we spoke on the phone, um, you said there was a turning point there, 
and I, I, I want to talk about this because I think it's important because I think some people, a lot of people would go through this, but you were, were saying you, you struggled with the cleaning because you didn't think it was, a, it was a trade or it wasn't masculine enough or it, well, was this going to be a career that would take me to where I wanted to be? And you had a moment there where you sort of sat on the fence before you made the decision to jump into it. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's where, that's where having that ground control element where the prior company because it had lawn mowing and landscaping and you know all the tools type operation it made me feel more comfortable as a 25 year old guy to say that we are ground control and property maintenance as opposed to kind of i was resisting the call then and as opposed to doing what we're actually good at and doing what our clients actually value and taking my pride out of it well my pride out of it at that point in time um yeah it was a massive shift for us so it's almost like taking a little bit of inventory on yourself and go what are we good at? What are people willing to pay for? And how can we actually have impact as opposed to what makes me feel cool in front of my friends um, and what doesn't pay the bills? So, yeah. 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 Mate, it's fantastic. So, like, you've had huge growth in a short period of time. Like, you would have had some struggles, I'm sure. Absolutely. I think um, there were a few little elements. There's one element I can remember crying on the office floor. Um, because I didn't understand the numbers. And I think something that's very important um, for us as trades and as builders in construction is to really have a, almost like a baseline business understanding so that we can make sure that things in the office are done properly um, and then also do our best work out on site. So is this, when you say crying on the office floor because you didn't know your numbers? It was, was cash this, flow. It's always cash flow. And was it overheads? Like, did uh, you... We had just moved into the workshop um, and it's a very cheap workshop. We've got 100 square meters. We look back on it now and say we're not moving out because it's that bloody cheap um, but at that point in time that was the biggest expense we'd made um, and we're also in our peak period so we're outlaying a lot on wages getting a lot of big jobs coming in and then waiting 60 to 90 days to get paid so yeah. there was that moment where I went fuck I've really <laughs> fucked this up um, but that's where you call on friends families and fools and you get a little cash injection and off you go again so yeah look yeah. I think it's important to talk about this sort of stuff because uh, like it's part of it's growing pains it is and it's it's moments like that where you're either going to own up and keep moving forward or you're going to sort of continue down the path and yep. continue going back to that place all the time. Exactly. And you're forced to either learn it or repeat the mistake again. And yeah. that was a really big thing for us. So we went out from there um, and it, that was a that was probably the start of my, of my movement from going, I'm a technician and I'm going to do really good work to I'm going to learn and understand how the business runs. And yep. I kind of had to position myself away from if a problem arises, I'm going to fix it myself to if a problem arises, I'm going to understand why the problem happened, learn kind of the models and the background behind it, and then either get my team and involve my team in, you know, problem solving it or make sure it doesn't happen in the future. I love it, mate. So, and, and it happens so much uh, in our industry and it's because like you loved cleaning. I loved being carpentry and building and like you might, people might love bricklaying or plastering, whatever it is. And it's the business side of things that can quite quickly take the passion away. Exactly. So yeah. um, the fact that you've sort of realized that at a young age and now, um, because you, you do a lot of work on yourself, don't you? Like you spend a I lot do. of time, yep. energy, and I think the most important money, like you spend money on exactly. yep. self-improvement. Yep. And I suppose the touching on the element of spending money on yourself, I think it's something very important where when you've invested money and the value of it usually has i suppose there's, there's equal effects so the more expensive it is the more you're going to pay attention um and what i've found is the more that you invest in yourself and more that you actually take time to invest in yourself the more attention you're going to pay to it and then your outcomes are lifted with it so yeah. um, a couple dollars here well you know a couple thousand dollars here invested on yourself is going to have you know 10x returns on your company and your community and those around you yeah yeah. So what sort of what sort of self development do you do? Like do you have mentors, coaches, like is and and it, is it is it all on the systems and processes of running a good business or is it is it more personal stuff? In the early days, um it was a lot about kind of business coaching, um mentors and kind of seeking out the guys in Adelaide in my local area, um subbies particularly who had built companies a lot larger than mine and then modeling elements and the goods and bads that they've done. Um so a lot of it was kind of you know, friendly advisorship, friendly opinion. Yeah. Um, then I worked my way into a couple, um, couple uh, business coaching programs just to understand how to systemize, um, how to market, how to read finances um, and that kind of thing. And then only recently 
um, after my son was born, I had to really take time to work on me as opposed to working on the company because the company was doing well and we were making money, but there was an empty feeling in myself. Um, and there was, there was something missing, you know, I, I had it all on paper, um, have a great wife, had a great newborn baby, um, and had a company that was, that was working and it was making money, it was generating income and there was something missing. So that's where I had to really go. I'm going to now invest in me. Um, so what, what was understand that? What, myself. What was the feeling? Because I, I think a lot of people get in this situation and they, they don't know what to do. Yep. The feeling, the feeling was holding your newborn child while they're crying and not knowing how to comfort them. And the feeling was not like being at work where you know exactly what to do and you know the purpose and you know the desired outcomes and you know somewhat how to get there. Having your child in your arms and not feeling, you can see the love from your partner to the child, but not having that direct, um, direct communication or direct contact, direct feelings. So that was where I kind of had to understand what had happened in my childhood. And I had a fantastic childhood, but what happened in my childhood that I cannot give myself permission to love my own child. And that was a massive thing that I had to work on. And it probably took me about 12 months of, of understanding, uh, understanding how guys operate you know no, understanding is, the masculine and feminine this is so awesome like we did we literally just finished like i said today's a, a double up we just yep. finished we had a um we had justin from about constructions on before this and he he's had a a, a very challenging 12 18 months and he's found breath work and we we literally just spent the last hour speaking about the like how blokes we just don't have any understanding of the feminine side and yep. and, and well not just blokes but the world like it's like and it's I, been um, it hasn't been allowed. Yeah, like we're all exactly. brought, brought we're, up. We're kicked in the ass. We've got like, to bottle it up. We're supposed yeah. to be the kind of we're supposed to be the rock, the strong person in the family that shows no emotion and goes out and crushes it every day. And I think what I think what we don't understand, well, what the vast majority of us don't understand is there's masculine and feminine energy, which is great to understand. But what we don't really know is feminine energy can be things like beer. Feminine energy can be things like hanging out with the guys. Feminine energy can be things like earthing on the ground and going out in nature. Things that we would usually go say, had we have not done this work, we'd go, man, I need to go camping. I need to go bush. I need to get on the piss with the boys. All of those things is just hypersensitive feminine energy that gives us the ability to go back and go straight into masculine again. And that's where you start that bad cycle of going work, 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 binge drink with the guys, work, 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 work. So having yeah. that understanding of, of, um, if I am going out and like, say this week, I've been out working really hard. I'm away from the family at the moment. There's certain things that I need to do. And I know I can feel those triggers coming of, you know, I'm thirsty for a beer, but instead of doing that, I know that I need to go out and see the sun for a little bit and just kind of chill. So, yeah, <laughs> mate. I think it's I think it's bloody fantastic, and uh, yeah, I, I think for someone your age. So, do you, do you mind telling us what your age is? Thirty one. And yep. so you're thirty one. Let's let's just go off track a little bit. Tell us. I think it's unreal. Like, tell us the awards you've won. Like, you've you've had this business going for five years. Mm -hmm. You've achieved a hell of a lot. You've gone from nothing to fifty, sixty staff. You've you've now expanded into two states. Yeah, um, you just said you want to have five by twenty-five, so like that's another three years. So, yep. um, tell us what you've won because obviously a lot of people are seeing what you're doing with this cleaning business. Yeah, and I I suppose the reason the reason for the award started obviously egotistical. I wanted to feel important, um, but the re the like I suppose a secondary reason to that is I can't win a master builders or a HIA award. Um, I can get on as, you know, subby of the year or something like that. So I'm thinking, how do I give my company the credibility? How do I give my company the free PR it needs? And I'm going, okay, well, let's Google Adelaide Business Awards. Let's Google Australian Business Awards. I made a spreadsheet of everyone yep. and every time they open and just went ham on on yep. uh, applications. So uh, in 2020, I got Young Entrepreneur of the Year, which is the South Australian Award for Business SA. Um, and that was another element of business coaching that then led on to that. Um, and then we've just put ourselves, um, I suppose out in the public eye as hard as we can, um, into the different awards so that we can then make sure that we're, it's almost like a reminder that we're on the right track because we can't get those, yeah. uh, awards that are in our industry. We had to go out and seek, um, the other elements. So only recently, um, 
I went out into an Australian award and got named uh, the Small Business Champion Entrepreneur, which was really awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no, well, and there's, well, there's a few more. There's a heap on your website there, but um, I just think it's, I, I love being around passionate people. Like I just, I can feel the energy in you. Like you, uh, you're you just radiating energy because you're so passionate about what you do. You're excited. Like exactly. you're excited for the future. Mate, I'm like, lit up. I'm scared as hell and I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way to be. Like if, it, if what you're doing doesn't scare you or doesn't excite you, then you've got to find something that does, you know, yeah. like there's no point waking up and going, oh, can't wait to get today over so that I can go back to the RSL and hit some cans. So yeah, yeah so there's more to life. Something that we um, we really talk about a lot with our members in my Live Life Build business is you've got to find what sets you apart. And so when someone asks you what you do, do you just say you're a builder? Like if you just say you're a builder, that's not going to work. Like and what you, do you say? What's If someone asks you what you do, what's your uh, what's your elevator pitch? Oh, mate, look, I've got a few of them. Like one of them is that I build people's dream homes. Or, um, one of them is that we look, we, uh, we're a client, like um, people. Like we're, it's not about the building, it's about building relationships. So I've got a few that I use. And we actually got a lady um, come into our Live Life Build business called Nicole Hathley. She runs a company called Brand True North. Um, we've done a lot of work with her. She's incredible at what she does. And it's like, I feel like you've found it. Like you've, you've found your purpose. Like you've taken it. Like when people ask you what you do, like, do you tell them you're a cleaner? No, no. We finish projects for builders that care. It's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's how, how much better is that than just saying I'm a cleaner? Exactly. Like, I, I think, um, something so important and it's just reminded me then of when you said, are you just a cleaner? Something so important about when we were starting the company um, that we pushed on branding internal and external was the fact that we wanted to make sure that when the Christmas party comes around at the end of the year and our staff are with their families, they don't say that I'm just a cleaner. We want to say I work for Bill Clean. Yeah. You know, there's something, there's something about the kind of the pride or the feeling that you get about saying that you work for the company um, or for the brand as opposed to what the job is. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Definitely. And it's a big mindset thing. Um, I love that. I love what you just said about that. The, um, but you, I feel like everything you're doing, you're just, you're stepping it up a notch. Like your website's fantastic. You just, you blew my mind because you said you, you do it all yourself. Um, but you've taken it that extra step, which a lot of trades don't. Like you've got the good photos. Mm. You've, you've got the good wording. Like when people come to your website, it's, they're not just, like they might be looking for a cleaner, but then they find a professional. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, um, it probably comes to the element of a lot of the subbies that I find, a lot of my friends who are, are tradies as well, spend so much time being a technician and so little time doing anything else that they just can't be bothered. Oh, it's not important. I don't need an Instagram page. I don't need to do any social proof without understanding how it's all an ecosystem that feeds each other. Um, and I just think guys are so incredibly overworked um, and probably a bit, um, maybe not, not unfulfilled, um, but probably almost a bit unthanked for, for the work they're doing. It's almost like a selfless act to go out and work as hard as you can. Um, and I think there needs to be more communication, probably, probably between the guys or us guys and our partners, um, to kind of bring in a little bit more healthy communication in the house so then that healthy communication can come out elsewhere um and those difficult conversations i mean i'm the first to admit having a difficult conversation with my wife is a lot harder than having a difficult conversation at work so um there's a lot to go there but i think yeah i think guys could really or guys could really invest better in their companies by investing in themselves first so uh, i think it all comes it all comes full circle yeah and it's like it's i, I find it really strange because i i i did I did exactly what I tell other people not to do now. Like I, I would put money into buying a new car or buying tools or buying the new fishing boat or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then I was always getting upset because I wasn't getting to that next level or I couldn't afford something else or whatever it may be. Um, and I think these days it's even worse. Like I'm, I'm so glad I, I broke that cycle because like now these days, like everything's driven by Instagram and what like people are always, I, I feel like a lot of people are trying to be something that they're not, they're mm. not being their true self. Yep. And by being, by doing that, they're putting so much extra pressure on them yeah, exactly. to be something that they really don't need to be. And do you know how fun it is just to be 
authentic. Yeah. It's so much fun, particularly if, um, you know, if we've got some guys out there who kind of know that they need to put their stuff on social media, know that they need to have an Instagram presence, but don't know how to go about it. Just hold the camera out, take a selfie of yourself, like tool belt, shirt off, standing on the roof truss, like, People want to see that shit. That's oh, so. all right for you, mate. Like young, fit, <laughs> healthy. Like, I don't, I don't even want to see any of that. I don't, don't see channel. many chippies <laughs> overweight, mate. If you're lifting roof trusses, you got plenty of good arms. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, then, and look, that's I'm I'm big on that. Like I think I think the other really big powerful part of that is when you do that, you're going to attract like-minded people. Exactly. Like clients that you want to work with, similar interests, similar personalities. Like I'm a big believer that if you're just showing all the like from a building point of view anyway, if you're just putting all the fluffy pillow photos up and not showing any of the behind the scenes. It becomes a bit clinical, doesn't it? Yeah, it's clinical, but you're also attracting clients that are, have got an unreal expectation because they, they're going to expect every single aspect of that building to be perfect. Yep. Because you haven't put up any stories or any videos about what actually really happens on the job site. Yeah, or communicating the the process and exactly how it happens, you know. Um, something that we find quite often is say, for example, uh, the client picks their bath and the bath arrives and the bath gets installed five weeks later. And then it's 12 weeks from there to handover. The clients expect that when things rock up to site, they are new and stay new and it's just not the case. So to be able to kind of portray the inner workings of the process would be like, it'd be such an easier communication between, you know, from start to finish of how things actually go on site. Yeah. Yeah, I liked um, one of your processes, mate. Our, um, and I saw that you, you like you've got different levels. So obviously that's different price um, points, I guess, for your services that you offer builders. Like, uh, yes. Yep. Yep. So one of I liked on there that one of uh, your options was that you'll note defects as you go. That's correct. So that's something that we do as standard. Um, it actually started um, started because we're the last guys on site, and we used to always get blamed for damage. Um, so what we did to kind of cover our asses is we go, we'll just take before and afters of, of every room, but it's actually turned into the point where we can identify areas where say there's concrete splatter on door tracks and windows. We can take a photo, send it to the builder, say, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to go as hard as we can and try and get it off? Or do you want to just replace the door or the, whatever it is? So, um, yeah, finding little things that we could do that helps the builder, um, and avoids kind of the last thing you want to do is get to the day before handover and find out, oh shit, there's a chip in the tile or that window needs to be replaced or the door handles off or there's no hinge in the bloody um, vanity unit or something. Yeah. So, so how are you doing all this? Have you, have you got a software that you're using? Yeah, we or? just run uh, there's a, there's a few bits of software. Um, I mean, there, there's quite similar ones. We run Tradify, you could run service mate. I don't have any branding yeah. with those guys, but yeah. do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Um, but there's a few platforms out there that really, that kind of changed the way we operate the company yep. um, and it kind of brings everybody together. I think it touches back on that communication element of being able to prepare a job, have the job notes that everybody understands and have it to be able to be updated the way through the process. And we're only on site for, you know, a couple of days up to a couple of weeks, depending on whether it's residential or commercial, but to be able to see the process on the way through and all of our before and afters and be able to communicate with yesterday's team to today's team about what's been done. I mean, yeah, and it's all just, through an app so um, yeah, it's yeah it's, i think it's fantastic but just the fact that you're even taking that initiative to um because we, we've never had that mm. like so many people just would wipe over a mark and hope that nothing ever gets settled and yep. then and then it's yeah, turning that... a blind eye or running away from elements and you know quite often it's not us um sometimes it is and i think um just by owning up to it one of our core values is own it and it's very easy for us to be able to if you know accidents happen you might bump a ladder into a wall it's so easy to either talk to the builder or ask the painter who's already on site would you mind just quickly touching that up for us as opposed to the painters go you're the day before handover and that wall needs to be flushed and painted again yeah i mean it's all just a bit of communication yeah yeah no i love it mate and yeah definitely owning things is a, a huge part of being successful because you're um and I, I think as like i know as a builder i would mate that's one thing that i just wish and and really talk to us all my trades about like and even when it comes down to scheduling like don't bullshit me like if i ask you when you're going to be on site 
and you know that it's not going to be for a week, don't tell me two days. Exactly. Because I'm going to ring you in two days. trades that need to move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got to ring everyone and move things around. And, and I'm going to be ringing you in two days and saying, where are you? You said you're going to be here. So take the stress off yourself as well and mm. just own it and be honest with me because then yep. I can be honest with everybody else. There's a bit of integrity there as well. I mean, it's not hard to say. What I've found is that the truth always comes out. It's just whether you want to tell the truth now and take it on the chin very lightly or whether you want to yeah. cover it up and eventually have to tell the truth and take it proper in the face. So, yeah. so mate, what, what else is it that you're doing differently? Like, cause, so you've obviously had exponential growth. Mm. You've got, I, I was blown away when I saw that um, over 40% of master builders in Adelaide are using you for their builders clean. Yep. Like what? What are you doing differently? Like, are you? Are you as far are you, as as far as the company goes, or as far as me personally as a company leader? Well, I guess both. Like, well, let's talk about the cleaning first. Like, mm -hmm. what do you? Do, what do you? What does your company do on a final builders clean that is so different that so many builders are jumping on board? We just don't fuck around. We don't cut corners, and we don't we don't skip things. We don't. We just. I feel it's hard to explain because. It seems so simple to me. It's just present it properly. You know, we do things like, let's go for some examples. Say you run your hands across the, you know, it's a marble bench and it's corked um, tiled a bench. It's not hard to rub your hand over and feel if there's any residue there. It's not hard to run your hand across the edge and see if there's anything that's gone over a little bit and just scrape it off. It's so simple things that it's not just look, it's it's actually feel as well. Um, and then we spray a bit of fragrance in the air as well because, you know, tile and glue and shit doesn't smell so nice and the yeah. homeowner wants to come in and see their brand new home. They want to see their dream. So yeah. it's the little things, kind of the last one percenters that set us apart from the others. And so what, what are you doing to... Because you, you you talk a lot about you take the stress off the builder. Like, are you are you touching base with the builder a couple yep. of days before, making sure the job's ready? Are you, have you got a process for when you're finished the clean to to let them let a builder know that it's completed and everything's sweet? Or like, yeah, exactly. So we kind of mimicked we mimicked commercial construction in that we saw that there are you know the company directors, there's project managers, people that oversee the whole project, you got your site supervisors, your leading hands, and everybody else that gets it all done. And we've gone, okay, well, if we're going to hand over a project to that standard, then we need to have the people that get it done. We need to have the leading hand to take four to five staff because you can't really manage more than that. Um, we need to have site supervisors, people that are going to take the equipment to site and actually get things done. And then we need to have a project manager to oversee everybody and make sure that everything throughout the process gets ticked off. So. Yeah mimicking what you guys had created for us um but taking it back in instead of running it like an owner operated company where the leader wears all the brunt of everything we've gone this is your project you quote it so to our project managers this is your project you quote it it's your client you see that project through to completion um and it's even as simple as you know say there is the odd chance where there's something damaged it's a text message straight away or it's a phone call straight away otherwise um, once we do finish the project um, and everything's all sweet, no news is good news. Um, then we're sending through just a PDF saying, um, you know, uh, bath plugs missing, um, something else, something else. Or if you don't get one, then you know you're all sweet. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's similar to like our aircon guy's good at it. They, they'll, fo like his guys photograph what they, like if they go and do a cut and a strip, I get sent an email or a, uh, message with photographs of each room where they've cut things out yep any notes like yep. whether it's hit a truss or a roof pattern or whatever like then the same thing when they come and do the fit off at the end of the job generally get sent some photos of everything finished and in place because mm. and it's just healthy communication it lets you know what's going on um we uh internally we do customer satisfaction as well so we did try do the automated thing where we send you out an email at the end of the job and it's got a smiley face and you can tick how happy or sad <laughs> it is yeah. Fucking never got done. <laughs> so instead, we rate our own grading system. It's just 0, 25, 50, 75, or 100. We call up the builder. If it's, yep, job's all sweet once they've had their walkthrough as well, we give ourselves 100 for it. If it's, yep, all sweet, but that's 75. If it's, well, 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 it's 50, and then you can work it out for the rest. So <laughs> it's that phone call, that extra piece of communication afterwards to go, we are human. We might have missed something. Can we help? And then usually out of that goes, well, We've actually got handover now, pushed out another week. Can you guys come in on Thursday? So having that extra bit of communication doesn't necessarily just make you go back and have to do extra at our own cost. Yeah. It actually is a good opportunity to upsell. And I mean, there's there's got to be more 
more communication around how the jobs are getting done because there is the opportunity for trades to do more um and it's just about having that chat yeah so matt how, how are you pulling all this off like how fuck if i know <laughs> absolutely <laughs> no I, idea I, like because like i'm sitting there hearing all this and i'm like well how are you competitive like because my cleaners turn up like I, I, there's a guy that we talked to on the phone he sends these crews out um like how are you competitive when you've got all these staff doing these different things it's hard it's hard and we've got really really low margins um and a lot of my friends um you know we we've got quite a nice little business community throughout you know our close group and they're all like they're dumbfounded about how we can operate on such low margins but for us that's what we've always known and that's the way we've always done it and there's no we can't just we can't skip it and we can't drop our standard because that's something that we're so tightly knit with we're so ingrained with our company so then on that so i probably use the wrong word there because i'm in our industry I, I hate being competitive because i like that's completely opposite to what i sell like mm -hmm. i i'm not interested at all in competing on price yep. and with all my subbies including a cleaner i pay for the service i get exactly so and, i would and, i would rather pay more and get a service that is going to be no hassles that i'm going to get a call at the end and tell that it's the job's finished that i can walk in and hand the job over to my clients and they're happy so like do you do you sell that you offer a better service than yeah than absolutely people? absolutely um it's not so much it's not a sales pitch um i think we kind of take it for granted a little bit um in adelaide just because we've got such a brand presence um but it is just you know when we have our first introduction on site it's talking about exactly what we are going to do and exactly what you expect from us it's having an educated conversation about what the service is going to be and setting the expectations um and i'm absolutely the first to say that we're not the cheapest i like to position ourselves at the top so that we can afford to do that yeah um do you sell that yeah because yeah, I, I got to a, I, I got to a point where that's one of the first things i used to say to my clients yep i will not, i won't be the cheapest i'll guarantee you that yeah but you have to own I'll do it. the best job exactly and there's there's no way i think i think as you were saying earlier there's there's no way that i can compete with with the owner operator the husband and wife duo um you know we could be three times more expensive than them and i, I can't do the mass production work it's not where our skill set is um it's not where we operate our best you know give me an 800 square meter house you know set on a buyer level um you know we'll absolutely do the best job we can we'll be able to reach high level windows um we're not yep. rocking up in a corolla doing a you know <laughs> a, a 95 square meter development and we're doing 600 of them yeah. i mean we do a few developments from time to time and that's just because the builders trust what we do yeah um and because they're punching them out quickly they want us to get it done and not have to check on it um but yeah custom homes and commercial projects that's where we um where we really excel so who's how are you selling this? Like, do you, do you do a lot of marketing, or you're at a point now where builders are telling builders? Like, what what's your marketing strategy? We've got pretty good um, pretty good word of mouth in, um, in Adelaide. Um, we also do a lot of brand awareness throughout social media. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that builders play on Instagram. That's kind of where you flex. <laughs> it's where you find your customers. Yeah. And for us as subbies, you've got to play where your customer plays. So um, we spend a lot of time on Instagram. Um, we've got our company page. I also push my personal profile as well. Um, and it's like we were saying before, the company page, we've set it up quite nicely where it is pretty and it's got all the hot photos. And then my personal profile is like, this is the real shit that happens. This is me <laughs> walking around on site. Like, yeah. yeah. So you've got to have a bit of fun with it as well. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think if you, well, if you, if, if you lose that passion, that fun, then that's when it starts becoming work. Exactly. Like, yeah. um, I, I think it's fantastic that you've found a, um, like, do you feel like you're working? Like, do you, do you nah, feel, nah, nah. Do you feel not like... anymore? Not anymore. Um, after I, I, I'm in a very, I'm in a very good position at the moment where the company's at a size where, my job has to be to step away from operational elements. Like I can't be running jobs and seeing things through to completion. I have to be setting the vision for the company so that we can employ more people so that people can get around our dream so we can give people better jobs than, you know, say working for us, I would say would be a thousand percent better job than working for that. Um, that husband and wife duo where you don't get looked after and you don't get beers on a Friday and those kind of things. So yeah. um, the position I'm in, I'm, I've got a lot of free time. And that free time is not so much, you know, I'm going to go out and play golf and take a jet ski out or whatever. Um, both of those things I really dislike. Um, <laughs> but it's more free time to go, you know, I need to work out during the day so that I can stay healthy. One of my big goals is to be in optimal physical and mental condition. 
Um, so I've got enough time to go, I'm going to work out for an hour to an hour and a half um, every day. Um, Exercise is huge, isn't it? Massive. Exercise. Massive. If, and again, one of my big things is if you're not right, nothing around you will be exactly. right. Exactly. Yeah. And then you, if, if you're not right and then you take that home, then you're going into taking your crap somewhere else and sharing that around. And then you're waking up the next day and bringing all that crap back in. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, what's what's your plan for build clean? Like, we know it's five by twenty five. Yep. But um, like staff numbers, like what, like have you got goals? Have you got big targets that you try and hit? I can't think that big. No. I can't. I there. It's let's go New Zealand. Yeah. New Zealand has definitely popped up in my mind. Um, what we'd really like to do, and I'm really open to people jumping in the comments and letting me know what we're really open to doing is because our our vision and, and what we're working towards is finishing projects for builders that care. I want to go into not just cleaning. Um, I think corking goes hand in hand with it. And I'm really interested in kind of without having to change the industry too much, doing something that's comfortable enough to go, we are finishing trades. So let's go painting, corking and cleaning. Let's go, you build the house let us finish it. And I'm really interested in exploring. I don't know if that idea is going to work, but let's go, if we can spread build clean around the country and then go, we're doing construction cleaning. Now we're doing your caulking for you. Now we're doing your painting as well. I'd wonder how that's going to look. I wonder how that works in resi, in commercial. I wonder how that sits in a bathroom renovation. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm I interested to see how it goes. I think there's something in it. I, I love the fact that you um, that you do the caulking and the cleaning because mm. they... Like it's the last two things. Like the cleaner's got to come in, clean it, make sure it's all clean, and then the caulking gets done. And yep. I think, um, so <laughs> I don't know, you might laugh at this, but one of the things that I um, spend some time with educating our clients on is the um, residue that's left after caulking. Because we went through a period where we would get people move into their house and so for, for anyone that's listening that doesn't um, know what caulking is, so caulking is basically the silicon. So um, on our projects, we silicon everything, not because we do a shit job, but I, I think it's a, a good finish, but it also helps with air tightness and stuff. So like we do all of our internal corners, our expansion joints, we do all of our uh, skirting Perfect. to tile, skirting to, to timber. And everything. We do window to wall, we yep. do uh, string it stair stringer to wall, we do aluminium window frame to timber jams inside and, and outside we do aluminium frame to render or whatever it may be. Like we, we go nuts on it. And yep. I just think it's one of the best parts of the job. Like I love turning up after the caulking's done and it just looks smick. Yep. Cause but all the, all the floors have been, you know, a little bit dusty and then they're pushed away and you see the perfect line between the skirting yeah, and the floor. It's just, so it's just beautiful. It's your, it's your first glimpse of what the clean house looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's basically silicon every single, um, last little bit of imperfection or they're not imperfections, but, um, gaps between things. Yep. And uh, that probably sounds bad, but it's not bad. But, um, <laughs> They've but, got to be so, there. They serve a yeah, purpose. Yeah, and that's yeah. where caulking takes something that's that's functional and makes it look appealing. Yeah, I mean, I, like one of my pet hates, like my, my two favorite caulking things are skirting to tile or skirting to timber flooring. Like just that crisp, clean line it gives you around the bottom of your floors is mm. fantastic. But also like your window manufacturers send the windows out. They staple the, the reveals to the window frames. And you quite often, like it might only be half a mil or a mil, but you get that little imperfection down where the timber meets the aluminium. Mm -hmm. And like the painters take the window up, they paint it and it shits me because you just, you see that little dark line if it's not filled up and just by corking around it, it's, it's smick. I love it. But to get that nice, clean smick finish for anyone that doesn't know, you basically have to mix up a really strong strength of soapy water or you might have a secret no, that's it thing. yep morning but, fresh all the way <laughs> so you basically get your corking you wipe your cork down the joint before you touch it you then spray the soapy water over it and the soapy water stops the silicon sticking to anything but the little bit that's already touched mm -hmm. on the surface and then you just wipe it off and it's a beautiful finish but we got we went through a period where we would hand houses over and we'd get these calls from people thinking that they'd use the wrong cleaning agent on their floors or their kitchen benches or something because they've just mopped the floor and now there's all this soap turning up everywhere. Yep. And so part of my handover is now, like I have to, I say to my clients, look, oh, 
so I explained the whole corking process to them and, and, and pointed out, oh, look, you can see all this bit of residue here. Like the cleaners wipe it down, but because it's such a high grade, it's like yeah, mix. So concentrated. So concentrated. It, it, it does take a few times to get watered down and disappear. So I talked them through that because for a while there, like I said, we were getting emails from these people saying like devastated. Oh, I've, I've mopped my floor for the first time and now it's covered in all this yep. soapy and there's, stuff. There's, a, there's a, I suppose, a few elements of the house that still, even though they're cleaned, cleaned and presented and ready to go for handover, there's still a few elements of the house that do need that yeah. little extra bit of maintenance. You know, like there, it has been a construction site. It has, it's a, gone from nothing to a new house, there is going to be dust particles in the air. Yeah. You know, you can wipe a, a nice marble bench or a nice kitchen bench top and 45 minutes later, come back, run your hand over and it feels gritty. And that's yeah. just because of the amount of dust that's in the air. Yeah. So there's but so yeah, many of those little elements. Yeah, but corking and cleaning go hand in hand. Like if I think it's fantastic that you offer those two services. Like I'm yet to come across anyone that's doing that. So uh, Sweet, this is good news. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think that's really awesome. But like you've, like one thing that's intriguing me about you, like you, you obviously are very driven and, and you, you're doing so well. Like you've taken a business that most people think nothing of, you've turned it into something pretty special. You're obviously building an incredible team and, and good culture. Um, and I, I just think it's fantastic, but you're, you obviously take a lot of notice of what's going on around you, like what the builders are dealing with, what the other trades are doing on site, what they're not doing, what they could be doing better. And you're coming up with solutions to solve that. Yeah, exactly. It's um, it's just needs-based learning, really. Like you look around, you go, what are the problems? What can I do? It's kind of, yeah, needs-based learning along with kind of there's a bit of, from my history, a bit of built-in salesperson of what more can I do? How yeah. much more can I do? How much more can I stay on site for? So it's those elements of like, if I can solve your problem, you don't have to do it. You can build more houses. I can clean more houses. Everybody wins. So, yeah. and I suppose it's the same with a lot of trades as well. The more you can do for the one builder, the less subbies have to go on site, the less foot traffic, less people to organize and the more income for you. I mean, everybody wins. So it's, it's a lesson that can, anybody can use in the industry, isn't it? Like yeah, you, absolutely. if you're a tiler out there, like, cause at the end of the day, the builder is the one that like his name's on it, like the clients they've come to him he's building their home when when the job's said and done they're having barbecues or whatever like it's a builder gets spoken about so like i know myself as a builder i'm i'm happy to pay um a bit more for a service if i don't get all the whinging phone calls if i can give you a set of plans you can understand it and you can just go and execute the job and if you like, rock up on time if you rock up on time <laughs> like and so I'm look. I'm definitely not the builder that is ringing around using different trades every single job. Like we've built a really good team. Like we find good trades, we keep them. Um, we we have like I communicate with them quite regularly. We like obviously they they can't just keep putting their price up to whatever they want. But there's a good relationship there, and I think the the relationships are very important. But finding trades that are passionate about what they do, like my my plasterers similar to you like he just he spends he's spending a lot of time and money on himself improving himself and and that he really goes out of his way to do a great job um and how good like, is that do you think that do you think that the work you're doing um and sharing such a good message do you think that has on flow effects for your trades as well do you think definitely. that them seeing what you're doing um even from shooting content on site to all the other great things that you're doing do you think that that then becomes your own little ecosystem of great people that you're building it goes two ways. So you either attract like-minded people that want to improve their business, want to impress me, mm -hmm. um, or it, you get the people that are like, holy fuck, I don't want to work for Dwayne. Like he's perfectionist. Like yep. I don't want to be getting picked at all the time. Yep. And that's fine for me because I don't want you doing my work. And there's plenty of builders that they can work for. So yeah. 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 But look, we've got an incredible team. We've got um, great electricians our like our plumbers done our work for years our plaster like like i said we we have conversation about them like we we obviously have to be uh on top of the pricing because mm -hmm. i need to continue to get work yeah but, um, we just can't keep pricing it whatever it is but in like i do think relationships and um pricing is only like a very small part of it i think service is the biggest part of it and that's, um, that's why we're here, you know. I think for our companies, we're here to serve and do the elements that we're brought, you know, the, 
the trade or whatever we're specifically brought in for. And then us as guys, we're there to serve for our family and our purpose um, and our legacy as well. So there's yeah. kind of two elements that go go into that. Yeah. I think people that, um, I don't know, I believe people that are always searching for the cheapest price, that they're, they're always causing themselves their own problems. Like, and, and I see it all the time. Like a builder that's ringing around trying to find the cheapest materials, timber, whatever it may be, he might find the cheapest materials, but then he'll deal with it not showing up on time or the wrong order showing up. Like there's always a consequence. Yep. Yeah, um, exactly. The, do you find, um, sorry to cut you off there. Do you find yep. that when you, when you put things out into the world, like say, say for the inverse example, you go and um, you buy something cheap uh, outside of construction that you knew that you should have got the right product for, but say you went to Bunnings and you bought the shit lawnmower. Yeah. Do you find that because you've skimped out on one thing, something else in your life also, there's like a reflection of it, something else skimps out and also yeah. say you pay it forward somewhere, that kind of good energy ends up coming back into you as well. Have you yeah. found that in the out in the marketplace? 100%. Yeah. 100%. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. If you start giving to people, particularly, you know, say it doesn't have to be monetary but giving time and you know helping and that kind of thing yeah shit just happens to you yeah. and it's really good stuff so yeah i made it what goes around comes around like mm. that that same example flows through everything like you like i know like our um some of our trades are definitely at the premium end of what um you pay for their service but um like using tiling as an example our tiler it's not just like the tiler we use it's his whole team and like we're happy to pay what he charges because he cares. And like the general clients don't understand a lot of this. Like you can find a tile that might be 20 bucks a meter cheaper, but they're going to turn up. They're not going to use the, the right glues. They're not going to like one thing that you get when you pay a premium is a set out. Like we are so anal on our set outs on site. So, and it's, a, and so you can't fix it once it's done. So a client might walk in and go, oh, why don't the wall tiles line up with the floor tiles? Yep, yep. Because you pay the Why is there a little piece next to the bath that doesn't quite sit right? Yeah, because you paid a cheap price and the tiler didn't have any time. Like he needed to make money, so he's rushed it and he hasn't done any setting out. Like mm. the first thing our tilers do on site is generally have a meeting with myself or the supervisor. We go, we lay everything out, we flick lines, we get a laser out, we check everything. And you could spend hours doing that before they even lay a tile. Mm. And it's no different to yourself with your cleaning. Like, I imagine um, the builders that are using you don't have to, like they turn up to hand their houses over and they don't have to have that um, hesitation in the back of their mind that shit, they're going to walk into a room and like, is the bathroom yeah. going to be... And they, like, they don't have the, the cleaning bucket in the back of their car knowing that they've got two hours to get this place <laughs> yeah, up to scratch. Yeah, race around so, and Yeah, clean and that's, that's all about providing the right service, you know, and, and that's with your other trades as well. If you, I, I worry that there's a massive race to the bottom in, let's say... Oh, half there is. of the industry there is. and then the other half of the guys are like we're going to do this properly um and it's just there's a, there's a weird mix going on between people who the trades that are doing great work with great builders and we're trying to service the other side of the market and we're getting absolutely stung on it so we come back to what we know and then there's kind of half of the industry is getting tainted yeah. and the other half of the guys are up here doing great work yeah like I'm so glad you're you're um you're on the same page with that mate, I, and I think that flows right through to the clients, like clients that are choosing builders or or trades, and, and I think I would love to see owner builders ban. Like I, it's a pet hate of mine. We don't work on a builder. Yeah, I'm we gonna... don't do it because there hasn't been there hasn't been a conversation of expectations. Yeah. So we just only license builders because yeah. it for I us love particularly. That. Like I love it, that. We can't. It's too late for us to communicate what the expectation is. It has to be set right from the start. So yeah. no owner builders for me. I'm sorry. Mate, Could look, change this, in the future, but not at the moment. <laughs> look, this is this will piss a lot of people off. It'll get people commenting, I, I guess. But I wish all trades would do that. Mm. I wish all trades would not refuse to do work for owner builders. So I, I personally believe that. Look, there, there's probably there's, there's people out there doing it for all different reasons, but. From my experience and some of the experience of I've had over the years with owner builders, most people that are wanting to do owner builder are doing it because they want to build it for the cheapest possible price they can. Exactly. It's and cutting they, out the cutting out the middleman, but that middleman is what actually finishes the project. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps the quality, knows the standards, builds it to code, knows those, what trades are good and what aren't. Yeah, all those types of things. So, um, yeah, like exactly like you said. Like I believe it swings and roundabouts. Like you. 
you pay more for good service you get good service it's reflected in the finished product and the client the stories the clients are going to tell their friends at barbecues for years so exactly um so mate let's uh, move on a little bit so like you're spending time energy and money on yourself you're you're growing an incredible business you're all over the place like you're up here this week from adelaide yep. doing a lot of business stuff yep exactly um, yes yeah, so for any builders in queensland get in touch with the guys hit me up yep hit me on um instagram just jump jump on and um shoot me a dm i'm nice and simple so yeah <laughs> but mate what what do you do like how do you is your life hectic or are you in control like do you get time for yourself yeah 100 percent there was um there was a time when it wasn't as easy as it is now um a lot of what's freed up my time is actually understanding that i do need to give people the responsibility to see things through themselves and make their own mistakes um everybody in my team probably well everybody in my team knows now that i'm a key delegator and it's probably a weakness in itself as well where i'll hand somebody something to do whether it's um in the office or whether it's a job on site and i don't want to know about it because i trust that they can get it done it's a big but thing. i probably should check in and make sure they're they're fulfilling it properly um or providing the guidance or the help that they need um but yeah because i've been able to do that i've freed up a lot of my time um to as i was saying before you know thinking and strategizing about the company but also trying to look at what is world's best practice um at for my position at the moment so um going from being um this was quite an important thing for me is changing my my um professional title to go from managing director to ceo um and it sounds wanky and I feel wanky seeing it on my business card, but it's something that I had to do to go, I am not the managing director. I am the person that leads the company forward so that I can create more managing directors. So um, yeah, by delegating a lot of the, a lot of the um, you know, day-to-day operational elements that I do, I've got the time to work on myself, make sure I'm showing up every day, make sure that I can be, I am, in such a clear space that I can be vulnerable enough with my team that they can ask me when they've got problems, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, um, or sharing the wins together as well. So I don't want to be that figure on a pedestal that's untouchable and, you know, driving around in yeah. bloody planes and shit. Yeah. Um, I want to be able to be, or to have the time um, and the clarity to be there for the team and also make sure that we're advancing forward as fast as we can mate you have got a bloody mature head on your shoulders i mean like for a bloody just over 30 year old the um i think it's it's amazing so mate i hope you go a long way i I definitely think you're on a good good thing with this um the business model you're setting up but like you were saying before that and and just run us through with it so you you're actually got a bit of a model that your team can grow within your business yeah exactly Yep. So something that we found um, quite early on when we were searching for project managers, and I'm sorry to all the commercial guys who spent four years at uni doing their degree to be a project manager. We've taken the name. We haven't put the backing behind it, (laughs) but it works for the industry. Everybody understands what the title is. Um, And it's something that we started early on where we have a lot of people that come and go. Um, like we've got a massive turnover of staff, a lot of students um, and a lot of people that use our company is kind of like a halfway job. It's a pretty cool company to work for. It's got great culture, but they're in and out, you know, in six to 12 to 24 months or so. And it's never going to be a long-term thing. So we do get some great people come in um, and some people really, I think the, the dream or the vision of the company resonates with them. Um, and they were the kind of people that make it to the project manager level. And there's also some people that, um, and you've probably felt this as well with your team, the guys that ask, what more can I do? Those kind of special people, we've gone, okay, we're going to reach a market cap in Adelaide eventually. There's only so many custom home builders. There's only so many uh, commercial projects getting done. How do we then map our model out somewhere else? So by systemizing that and having these great people who need a career um, and need something more, they want to grow and actually have skin in the game with us. Um, we've now gone, okay, well, let's start new entities go into partnership with them um, and they know everything that we know we can provide the brand support um, and also you know any other kind of support that they need and let's just have some fun with it so yeah. that's our um our model for growth at the moment yeah awesome so you're and you're saying before like it's working because some of your staff might have family in interstate or somewhere so you're actually possibly giving them the opportunity to 
run a part of your business and also be able to get back and spend time with their family. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We made a strategical change um, not so long ago to there. there is the best return on investment in Sydney just by population alone. But that is not the best move for the company's strategy because we have people involved in our company and the people come first. And if they are not vetted in what we're doing, then it's going to fall down. So the strategy shift goes to, well, let's have the conversation with the potential director, go, where would you like to move? What's your ideal life look like? Whereabouts are your family situated around the company? Let's make that the strategic move as opposed to going, you're great. We're going to ship you off to Sydney where you've got nobody. <laughs> so I think it's really important it. to, to have those conversations with your yeah. team and understand where do you want to be? Where do you want to go in the company? How do you see your life planning out? It's not just rock up to work, stamp a, a time card and head home. Mate, I, I absolutely love it. We With our, our members in Live Like Bill, it's, it's another thing we we strongly sort of advise them on like because in in my team like i'm really big um, we had a team meeting on this just the other day like you've got to um ask your team like what are your goals like do you want to work here forever or do you want to be your own builder or like and if i can put systems and processes in place or educate them or help them like all right they might want to be a builder which means i'm going to lose them in a couple of years which look to be honest is, is shit i'm gonna to have to train someone else but in the meantime, they're going to work really good for me because they they, they want to learn how to get to exactly. where I am. Yep. So and then by having that that healthy conversation with your team as well, you can go, cool. Well, their days are numbered. You know, they've got 24 months left. I can get an apprentice in at 12 months time, pair them up together. Then they can share the knowledge so that you're not just up and leaving yeah. and taking away all this knowledge with you. It's kind of, it's yeah. Feed, yeah, but it's feed um, the hand. Yeah, and and just making them feel like they are part of something like the last thing I, I ever want for anyone that works in our companies is to just feel like they're turning up to do a job like you I want them to feel like they're part of exactly what we're trying to do and, and that's yeah based around what we we're saying earlier about having that purpose and being aligned with it and actually it resonating with you so that then you can portray it out to your team as well so yeah, yeah knowing exactly what you want to achieve is so much easier to talk to your team about then rocking up to work and kind of dodging things because you don't really know. <laughs> so, mate, what? How do you get away from it? Like, if, like, you got a lot going on. You got a rapidly growing business. You're you're taking out entrepreneurial awards. Like, what? What's your breakout? What's the? I know we touched on bikes before. Like yeah, bit of, bit yeah. Of bike riding rider. bikes is something that really excites me. Um, I found that. Um, motorbikes, real bikes, riding motorbikes, exactly. <laughs> Trail riding bikes. motorbikes, um, enduro really excites me because I've found that through growing the company, you kind of get a little dopamine hit, you get a bigger job, you get a little dopamine hit, and those they've got diminishing returns, they don't top you up eventually. Um, and riding bikes is one of the only things that is so incredibly dangerous that I can't think about work, I have to be fully focused in it. Um, and it's something that I come back and feel really refreshed from. The body is killing me, but I feel a lot of clarity around doing something that is away from work where I can't concentrate on it. Yeah. So it's just, it's getting that mental, I guess, bit of a break, like yeah, shutting off. Separating yourself from work. Cause, yeah. And you, you'd find this as well. You're standing in the shower in the morning, you're thinking about work. It doesn't necessarily mean you're thinking about something on site, but it's, how can I improve this? How can I tweak this? How can I change this? What was the conversation I had with the staff yesterday? All of those elements is just constant. Well, you know? I, I, that's why I do the cold showers, mate. That's, exactly. That's, that's my thing because I, I was doing that. The cold showers helped me stop that because for two minutes, yep. I'm just focused on not feeling the cold. Exactly. And you come out and you don't you don't necessarily switch back into work mode. There's kind of a, a cooling off period. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. all about the cold showers. They are brutal in Adelaide at the moment. <laughs> Absolutely brutal. So I start warm, yeah. I do my showering bit and then I look at the tap and I go, fuck it, let's do this <laughs> and rip it open. So yeah, I always start on warm and finish on warm, but definitely, definitely but get it, around the cold shower. But some people, like, I still get people that ask me about my cold showers because I've, I've put it out there. I'm everywhere but um cold showers have been a massive game changer for me like it just just having the um i guess the strength to stand there for two minutes and not turn that cold water off yep and it's something um, you don't need to purchase anything different you don't need some wang fang blue light blocking glasses and you know all the rest <laughs> of it that go along with it 
Um, but there's definitely things that I've found as well that work for some people and don't work for others. You know, cold showers work great for us and we really enjoy probably the rush. Yeah. Um, I have tried doing the meditation elements. I've got the Headspace app on my phone. I find it very hard to do the meditation element. Oh, there's something yeah. about me that I just can't figure it out. Yeah. But as a substitute for elements like that, meditation kind of fundamentally is time for yourself to switch off to go inner as opposed to outer. And I can do that walking around the park. Yeah. You know, somewhere that I'm so in tune with that I do it so often that there's no real external stimulus because it's all the same. And walking around the park gives my body something to do while my mind can switch off. So I think it's really important for um, kind of all the all the guys and girls out there that you don't have to do the perfect ice bath. You don't have to do the perfect meditation. You, you, you can do you. yeah adaptations yeah. of these things and ease into it. It's not just one day I wake up and I'm going to cold shower, I'm going to ice bath tonight, I'm going to go and do this massive CrossFit workout yeah. um, and then I'm going to meditate for three hours. Like yeah. Some yeah. things we just can't do. Find what works for you. Do, are you a routine person? Like, Do you have yep. a daily routine? Yeah. Only, only recently, this is something um, that a friend of mine uh, kind of introduced me to and it seems very simple. Only recently have I decided to try and wake up naturally. And it is a scary feeling because when you go to bed at night, you're wondering, am I going to be late? Am I not going to get a jump on the day? Because I've always <laughs> gone, it used to be a 4.30 start, then it was a 5.30 start. And now since my son's been born, it's kind of a 5.30 start. And I know that because he's home, they always wake up early. You know, it's either 6.30 or 7 by the time he's awake. Yeah. I know now that I've almost got that little safety net. And you'd be surprised when you don't set an alarm you end up waking up within this kind of 15 to 20 minute window of when you usually would anyway. Mm. And it's so much nicer. Yeah, I don't have an alarm. It's beautiful. Yeah, but my um, my thing is like I've, I, I I can't control when I wake up. So like just, it's part of the being in the trade, I guess. Like just between four and five every day, I'm awake. Yep. And uh, if you try and bloody lay there and go back to sleep, like you just feel like shit for the whole day. So exactly. like once, once I'm awake, I just get up, but yep. my problem is I need to make sure I go to bed because, like, I can't control when I can wake up. So mm -hmm. if I don't control when I go to bed, I'm losing sleep. So, yep. um, which which it gets hard, and you're you're going to learn this as your kids grow up. Like my um, like I like settling down at the end of the day, having dinner as a family, spending whatever it ends up being an hour, hour and a half with the kids, whether it's helping with homework, watching a show on telly whatever but then and then putting them to bed like my wife and i we're, we're i don't know if we're old school or whatever but like our kids go up do their teeth go to bed and we go up every night sit on the bed talk to them for a minute occasionally read them a book if they want or whatever mm -hmm. but and i love that time but then i don't really switch off until that time's done so exactly like, that's with, just part and parcel with parenting i'm yeah, starting to so, find out is that there's a little sweet spot kind of sacred time for yourself <laughs> kind of after that and my yeah. son goes to bed at seven and there's a little sacred time from like 7 30 to 8 30 and then i'm always to bed by 8 30 so yeah it's like sitting on the toilet mate like it's only like there's, <laughs> you got to have these little the door bits. flies open yeah. and it's knock 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 dad 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 it's, yeah it's like, you got to get this little bit of own time but um so yeah i'm finding like because like my oldest one's um just about to turn 12 so it's um so by the time they get to bed now, like that's that's starting to get around eight thirty. So then by the time we do that, and then I take half an hour to chill out, like it's pushing nine thirty, sometimes ten o'clock, and then because I I'm waking up between four and five, I'm I'm exhausted. So um yeah, I'm I'm big on the routine thing. So like I've I've got in my schedule now, like the time that I need to go to bed, I get the little yeah, ten minute yeah, warning. Yeah, bedtime reminder. Yep. Yeah, those little things definitely they definitely do make a difference. Um, I go through phases when you were saying about how scheduled and routine i am i went through a phase where i would set reminders every three hours from 6 a.m to remind me to eat because I'm, I'm like i'm really yeah. enjoying um kind of getting back into the gym and you yeah. know i'm enjoying feeling confident in myself um after spending so much time in the office sitting down going from technician on site to sitting in the office to getting up to like 94 kilos and my ideal weight's like 87 so i was 10 over um and i'd got to the point where I was setting myself alarms so that I would remind myself to actually stop, eat, yeah. and then get back to it. And it's, yeah. um, yeah, I've turned it off now because it's become a bit more natural, but it's those little things that you can do and it's all available just on your phone to make your life so much easier um, and get things out of your head. Mate, for all the people that are listening, if they're looking for a builder's clean, where do they find you? Uh, jump onto at build.clean. 
um, on Instagram or Google Build Clean. All right. So um, before we wrap it up, mate, just something new that we've been trialing is uh, we ask every guest to give us a question for the follow the guest that's coming on next. So um, the guest that we had on prior to you was Justin from Abode and his question is, what is the one thing that when you go home tonight to your wife, um, just the one thing that you could do that might make a big difference to your relationship? Oh, what an awesome question. Um, and thank you very much for posing it. The one thing I could do when I get home tonight, the one thing I will do um, is give my wife a big hug and not just a walk into the house, hey babe, smack her on the bum and go and do what I'm doing. But it's something that, you know, a four or five second hug, we actually take a moment to embrace each other. I think that's really important. Um, I don't do it enough and I really should. So thank you. Thank awesome, you for reminding mate. Awesome. Me. So what's what's the question? What's what's the question you want to ask for like so you don't know who it is, who like yep. what they're about, what they do, whatever. What's one question we can ask the next guest? I would like you to ask the next guest what are they doing right now to show up as the best version of themselves? Sam, that is an awesome question, mate. Thanks so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Really Cheers, appreciate mate. it. Everything discussed during the Level Up podcast with me, Dwayne Pierce, is based solely on my own personal experiences and those experiences of my guests. The information, opinions and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. We recommend that you obtain your own professional advice in respect to the topics discussed during this podcast.